I'd like to talk today about tic disorders and movement disorders in general, including Tourette syndrome. These are very common conditions which have fairly straightforward treatment options, which can cause immense um, help in families and children. This is a joke, of course. These are local tics I found, but not those kind of tics. So our objectives this afternoon is to talk about different abnormal movements. I'll give you a broad classification. We'll talk about some of the common movement disorders in children and focus because it's as highly relevant for uh, treatment options as tics and Tourette syndrome is very related. And then I'll discuss some treatment medication-wise for movement disorders in general. Um, during this talk, you saw from my preamble, we'll have a couple of videos as well. I can act out many movement disorders and it'll be to your amusement if you like, but I will also show you some videos of good examples of actual patients. So just some few definitional words. Ticks are pretty straightforward. There's some repetitive behavior. Um, it's often motor, but it <coughs> can be a vocal or a throat clearing stereotype as well. They're usually quite repetitive and quite similar, but they can change. We'll talk more. A stereotypy is a little fancier term for a little fancier version of repetitive movement disorder, which is in the tick obsessive compulsive disorder family, but they're more complex. And I'll show you a nice video of a child doing a stereotypy. Korea literally means dance-like, so these are the writhing dancing movements. Sydenham's Korea is a prototypical example we'll talk about, and I'll show you that. Dystonia is where our muscles that move one way agonist and the other way antagonist both fire at the same time. You get these twisting, contorted, and actually painful movements even to imitate. Uh, myoclonus is large shock-like movements of large amplitude muscles. And then ataxia is usually thought to be more of a cerebellar issue, literally means without order. So the easiest example is people stumbling around because they're intoxicated for some reason, but there's other diseases that cause ataxia as well. I mentioned all these movement disorders in turn now because even experts in movement disorders often argue at meetings like this about what the patient has. And that's because all of these are abnormalities of the basic anglia and different parts of our brain that coordinate movement. And it's very complicated, and one movement that's a chorea can merge into a dystonia, and there's a lot of overlap in all these movements. And the medications we use, which I'll only talk about briefly at the end, because these are basal ganglia disorders, really for the most part are modulating that systems. Dopaminergic, GABAergic, cholinergic, things of that nature. So tremor is what well, easy, um, reassured type condition. It's almost essentially normal experience. When people have a little more tremor than they should, we call that benign essential tremor, often runs in families. There's an example here of things you want to look out for, thyroid and electrolyte issues. Usually by the time they come to see me as a neurologist, that's already been done. You don't need an image if there's a family history and the patient's otherwise normal. Uh, Wilson's disease, if you want the zebra to think about, can present as tremor, but again, usually there's something else going on for Wilson's disease. And the treatment is usually to just block that adrenergic impulse with a beta blocker, but other medicines listed there can be used as well. And this is my first test to see whether we can get the videos to work. Let's see. So this is slow. OK. OK, so low amplitude, fairly sinusoidal movements of the hands. This is essential tremor. Often when one sees patients with this movement disorder and other ones, one question should always be is, should you even treat this? Is there a problem? And the answer often is no, but one take-home point for this is one does not always have to treat movement disorders. And I'll talk a little bit to identify of time about some of those distinguishings. Korea is a dance-like movement, so most of us are familiar with. Again, Sydenham's Korea is the best known example, and it's important to know about that. Uh, but Korea in general can be seen, most commonly I see it in people who have some sort of brain injury, hearkening back to my talk earlier this morning with cerebral palsy as associated with perhaps a hypoxic ischemic injury again. And then this again is a basal ganglia injury to the young brain. And those patients often have fairly clear other signs and symptoms. They may have spasticity, they may have epilepsy, something's going on with that brain, and they have this lifelong movement disorder that becomes very choreic. But the post steptocrocal post-streptococcal syndrome, other known as Sinham's chorea, um, is important to know about because that by itself 
will give you criteria for a streptococcal illness and has uh, treatment manifications. But we can also see this in vasculitis, as well as again, various endocrine diseases, as well as drug toxicity. Um, it's usually fairly acute onset for the conditions I listed. If it's more of a gradual onset, you can think of some other disorders, including degenerative disorders and genetics, such as Huntington's disease, which we do see in children. Okay. So I think this is going to be sideways. Let's see. Okay, turn your heads. So, sorry about this, but you can see. So, constant movements. Think of a constant dance going on, so doing some fine finger movements, and her legs just keep going. Completely normal mentation. So follows commands well. Fine movement control is actually totally normal. This is a good one, trying to control these muscles, and her legs keep going. So that's partially a distraction move, asking to do one thing and looking at the rest of the body, which is a common technique. So she's just in constant motion, and she has Sydenham's chorea. Let's close this down. So it often could be asymmetric, meaning that you may have problems more on one side of the body than the others. She was fairly symmetric. And then this milkmaid's grip is this repetitive motion with the hands where you're choreic, and they just kind of do this for some reason. Um, touchdown, that's what she was showing at the end. When you put your hands up, this is, and you move this kind of thing, and the tongue is also very involved with various choreic movements. So this by itself gives you, again, as you, I'm sure you know, a rheumatic fever diagnosis just with the sit and hams. Um, after your workup, and you can look for these other signs as well. And then the other thing is, even though this is again the basal ganglia condition also, you have to worry about other abnormalities with your brain, which are really controlled by your cerebral cortex. But since our basal ganglia really subserves many functions, in addition to purely movement, this should not be of surprise. Um, everyone should be on long-term antibiotics to help prevent the complications of the streptococcal illness, and we may use steroids or IVIG for different patients, but again, they really don't affect the overall options, but may help with the initial presentation when you're trying to sort out what's going on. There's a lot of debate about this, how the brain is affected by streptococcal um, cross-reacting antibodies and the mechanism, and there's a whole other condition, which I had slides, but I saw I take it out, about an entity called PANDAS, which is just a minefield. I'm not going to wade into, but uh, there's a lot of concern, questions about how infections, how the brain gets involved in movement disorders and what that means. So the main topic is tics. Now again, these are very stereotype brief movements or sounds. Many people in this audience, I bet if I look too long enough, have tics. I make a hobby of collecting people's tics and see what they do. Many people can have a little movements of something. They may do an eye blink. When I was a training, I had a resident, or when I was a resident, I had a very famous professor who I thought liked me and was always winking at me, and it took me about a year to figure out that he had a tick disorder. That was embarrassing. But usually these ticks start with children, and that's why we're talking about this audience. Now this is a big teaching issue where I always ask a child first after I made this diagnosis. I said, do you care about these? Because I don't care about these. And often the child will say, no, I don't care what's going on. Why am I here? So we have a discussion with the family about should we treat, whether this is something to worry about. Um, and that's just part of the discussion you want to have is just because they have a diagnosis doesn't mean you should always treat everyone with medications. By the time they see a neurologist, though, it's usually of a degree of severity that's either disrupting them, they're disrupting school. So there's a little bit of a referral bias I certainly have. But the patients you see may have very mild tics, either uh, motor or vocal, and it may be driving the parent crazy, but it doesn't mean you should treat the child for that. So a couple of rules about tics is it's by definition, as a movement disorder, it's involuntary, but they can stop it briefly. But it really hurts them to stop it because this is an obsessive compulsive equivalent, right? So the obsession is, I got a twitch, I got a twitch, I got a twitch. And if you tell someone not to do it, we can use our cortex to say no for a while, but over time, that obsessive compulsive nature will win out, and then it busts through and they've got to do it. So one of the most stressful things for a child particularly at school, if they perceive people are looking at them, 
is people will tell them, don't do that, stay still, do that. And that really makes it very difficult for them. And they may control it during the day, but then they go home that afternoon and just fall apart because they're just holding everything for so long. So I think it's much better overall, I can tell my approach, just let him do it. I don't care. Other kids will very quickly tire of looking at you and life will move on. Almost all movement disorders stop during sleep. So anything that happens during sleep is a red flag for something else going on and ticks follow the right pattern. It fluctuates, meaning stress, time of day, tired, can have more or less. Um, and also ticks migrate too, meaning they start off in one part of your body or one flavor, but they will change and become something else. You actually want that history to reassure you that this is a relatively benign condition, not some fixed issue. Like I said, younger kids may not even be aware of what you're talking about, simple or complex movements and vocal or motor. And there's a very simplistic definition. Most patients, again, at least the ones that make it to a neurologist who have a tick disorder, um, they do have vocal and they do have motor tics. And guess what? They have Tourette's then. So that's not a big deal, but that's sometimes people get freaked out when they tell them you have Tourette's. And they're like, no, not Tourette's. But it's just a matter of nomenclature and discussion. Other things you may think about in the movement disorder world for tics, um, I should have mentioned seizures. Anything that comes and goes in neurology could be a seizure, but tics are usually pretty different. But myoclonist, that I mentioned before, these larger movements, um, usually more forceful, more stereotyped, and these are more like big jerking type movements or falling down. The Korea example I showed you, again, just pretty different, but again, all these things merge from one into another. And then the other category is, I don't know how often you see it here, but a functional disorder, really a conversion disorder, we often see with a pseudo tick or a pseudo movement disorder. And by definition, these are not volitional, but they're not a true movement disorder in the way we think about them and really require more of a psychiatric evaluation. So again, if I have both motor and vocal tics and strictly uh, about one year, and by the time you see a neurologist, it's probably happening for one year anyway, congratulations, you have Tourette's syndrome. Not a big deal, but that's just a word we use and often labels um, can hurt and also help. They can help if they can open services and understanding. There's also Tourette's syndrome associations and people who can help you or your child with dealing with this diagnosis. It's relatively common from my perspective, about half a percentage. It's fairly universal, everyone's affected, it's equal opportunity, except this is one of those diseases that boys are more than girls. So. And then one thing we like to talk about is this is the tip of the iceberg. The ticks up here are easy to hear and see, but all these other things go along with probably a basal ganglia dysfunctional type syndrome. So many of these patients have problems with focus and attention as well as OCD. And you can have, remember the Venn diagrams you may learn at one point, where you can have the ADHD and the OCD all together. That's a fun sweet spot there, but these patients are the ones who can have it. So all these other comorbidities are beneath the surface, and these are the ones that are really going to affect your patient's life and need to be thought about. You can control ticks fairly easily, but if you forget about all this, your patient still will um, not do well, and if you ask them, they'll tell you the same thing. So how do you treat? Um, this is for Tourette's. How do you treat Tourette's? Again, you look for the comorbidities, because if they have bad ADHD and they don't have the right school environment, they're gonna really fail, no matter what their tics are. And I try to reassure and discourage treatment. And I'm about 50% effective in having the families walk out without a prescription and don't come back. And maybe that's a bad business move, but if they don't need to be treated and they're reassured nothing bad is going on, I think that's a win for everyone. There is some use with magnesium. Uh, the more typical medications are you more the alpha agonist. So using guanfacine is a medication we'll use in the United States a lot. Different seizure drugs like topiramate or topamax and anti-dopaminergic skin because it's a basal ganglia disorder can be very helpful too. We have more of a trend though. We're trying to get away from medications. And the CBIT is something. This is cognitive behavioral intervention therapy. This is a way with a therapist that doesn't require that much training can work with a child and kind of deal with the obsessive compulsive issues. What's bothering you? What's your stress? How can we deal with it? Because we think in some bigger sense that the tics are the motor vocal manifestation of this OCD and stress. And if people can deal with those issues other ways, maybe it won't come out as strongly with the tic, which can be disruptive. So CBIT is something that we are training more and more people through fairly straightforward, um, short, programs to become CBIT therapists to then empower the children and the families to try some non-pharmacological approaches, which I think is very helpful. All right, steroidopy. 
this again is in the tick family, but it's usually more complex. And I should have mentioned earlier, the tick disorders are usually in the school age kids, six, seven years old is typical. Seratopes are in younger kids, and this tends to worry families more. They're doing something, they seem okay, but they got that weird whatever, and then we see more patients for stereotypies. So stereotypical, repetitive, similar, and it does have this association with children with autistic spectrum disorders, but this is totally a normal finding and can be in very normal children too. You should probably wonder, is this child autistic? But hopefully you'll know that already or have that suspicion already. Um, they're much more purposeful type movements and that they do again and again, hence the name and different complexities. And for some reason, kids seem to be more aware of them and actually seem to like doing it. And that also can make their families a little bit nervous, it seems. And when I started my career, I collected videos of everything. And now I just go to YouTube <laughs> because people put everything up there. And there's no issue. So this is a young child that you can't read the comments, but they're all about what's going on with my child. Are they doing this or that? And she's just been doing this hand thing. And you certainly can see this in children with autism, but this is a normal child, and I know from this four-year-old here, this was years ago, she's completely normal in every way. And it even says on there, she's stimming herself, non-autistic. So if you read a little too much or watch too many videos, you may worry about this, but again, this is considered to be normal movement disorder, and it can be any part of the body, but it's usually fairly motor. Again, she's younger than the, um, the tick Tourette patient population. Okay, good, this all worked. And I'm done.